my name is Estrella Sainberg, and I am an LHIP alumni from Minuteman National Historic Park and a soon-to-be outdoor recreation planner at Minute at Juan Bautista de Anza National Historic Trail in just two weeks. So again, I was just in your shoes last year, and I'll be starting a job within the National Park Service very soon. So between today and tomorrow, we'll be hearing about the amazing work you all have been doing this summer. Today in particular, we'll be hearing from the DHA interns during the morning and in the afternoon. And so this is an opportunity to learn about the amazing work your colleagues have been doing, about parks maybe you've never heard of across the country, and celebrate one another. So as so in our for our DHA presentations, uh, we will be hearing from four during this session. As a reminder, each presentation is 10 minutes. So this is for you presenters. Um, listen up. And also, as a reminder, you will have a two minute question and answer period. Uh, for the question and answer period, Stephen will bring the microphone to you. And to those presenting, uh, you can see down on the, my right, your right hand side, when you come up here on your right hand side down here, Chanel will be uh, waving the bird um, with a three minute warning and a one minute warning and then a stop. So you do have to follow that stop or else uh, Chanel will stop you <laughs> Some, somehow. We will find out how. Uh, we don't want to find out how, though. Um, so as you can see here on the slide, we have uh, four in, we have four interns. So first, we will be hearing from Tatiana Mihaita, Amin Esbahi, Gia Flores Arellano, and Miko del Castillo. So first, let's welcome up Tatiana Mihaita who was an intern at Rocky Mountain National Park as an Art in the Park intern and my fellow uh, LHIP alumni from last year. So please welcome Tatiana. Hi everyone, give me a second to set my notes up. Don't start the timer yet. <laughs> I gotta set myself up. Okay. This is my clicker, this works? Okay, great. Okay, you can start now. <laughs> Hi, my name is Tatiana Mihaita, and I was the Art in the Park intern at Rocky Mountain National Park, and I worked on the East Side interpretive team. Because art is subjective and is in the eyes of the beholder, my presentation is called Through My Eyes Are Rockies. Um, here's a little bit about me. You will see why I chose certain programming and the way I ex executed it because of my background. I'm a Brazilian Romanian first generation American. I grew up in South Florida where diversity was the norm for me and all these aspects are very much a part of my identity and affects how I see the, view the world. My undergrad education is in park, sorry, the screen went black. My undergrad education is in theater and psychology. My master's is in park management and recreational therapy. All this has influenced me to be an advocate for inclusive and accessible recreation. And my approach in this internship was to find ways to combine all of this to make art in the park programming accessible at Rocky for um, individuals with varying abilities and backgrounds. And because recreation is truly meant for all people. So during my internship, I piloted eight new programs and coming from a performance background, what better way than to showcase the art that was created over the summer than through a documentary. They're supposed to be sound. The concept was to see how the four different ecosystems of the park inspired art being created at that moment. It's important to mention 
our in the park programming has pretty much sought, stopped since 2019 when the artist in residency program took a hiatus. And so the park knew that art had a positive response and, um, and previously was having a lot of um, success. And so they wanted to find a new way to bring that in. And that's why I was brought in. Um, I am now going to focus on my top four programming. Like I said, I did do eight or um, eight new programs, and most of which were featured in the documentary, but I'll just give a little bit more context. Um, this one not featured was Rocky Mountain Stretches, the nature-themed programming that where I melded fact, together facts about the park and physical movements that are similar to yoga. Um, for instance, the number 11 pose, I would transition from the garter snake pose if we were to doing standing, and then I would go into um, I would say, OK, everyone, let's scrunch up real tight. OK, now we are hibernating black bears. So let's all snore. Function, function, function. OK, now it's spring and there's lots of food. So let's do a big stretch. Oh, yeah, I'm hungry. So do all bears hibernate? And so I would go each pose is essentially like that, that there's a fact with the stretch and things like that. Um, and so I did this program four times and I had a, uh, about 70 participants. And since not everyone enjoyed or wanted to be, you know, going through the full sequence of sitting down, standing up, I did do modifications and not everyone could do certain um, poses. And so I would, for instance, the butter, like traditional butterfly pose or our Western tiger swallowtail, you could do it um, with your arms instead, instead of going with on the floor. And it'll still have the same effect. And just like you see there, there's sitting positions and stuff for the hibernating black bear. My next program, which you keep seeing all these, this picture, <laughs> this program involves using coloring pages of nature related to park and discussing them. And then I did becoming a bird pro um, outreach program where kids mix and match uh, what birds they think they belong to. And then they taught, we taught about the bird in the nest and the activity involved decorating a bird mask. They're um, an egg and making a nest out of pipe cleaners. They became a bird. And these craft programs were delivered four times and had a total of 123 participants. A really well, a really well received program was watercolor postcards. I did this pop up once and there was 47 participants. And other national parks I know have done this, such as the Nali. And there was one woman who was getting a bit emotional because her father had passed away and was an artist, but she didn't paint. And she said that this activity made her feel connected to him and she could feel his presence during this moment. So for my clay wildflower painting, I used air dry clay and a stencil impression to stamp into the clay. I only, in one program alone, I had 42 visitors participate and I did this program twice and I had a total of 62. No one in all these programs I was doing had ever created art in a park or has seen parks do this type of programming. I had as young as three years old couple celebrating their fifth and 10 year anniversary and also in their mid 70s. Everyone in the family tend to participate in some capacity. And before we move forward to the next slide, I want you to close your eyes if you feel comfortable and imagine a family of four, a mom taking two young adult sons who have a neurodevelopmental diagnosis such as autism and have and a grandmother with in her late 70s who has a shaky hand that won't stop moving. They all want to participate in painting, but the question is how? The sons found a paintbrush they're familiar with, and the grandma's hesitant and keeps repeating, no, I can't do it. I can't paint, my hands just shake too much. You can open your eyes. The story I told you was an imaginary. As you can see in the videos playing above, these were real people, real visitors that want to participate in programs that other able-bodied individuals do. I'll go into detail in a moment about the tools that were used. But you can see her hand was clearly shaking and she she knows it. she told me this was going to happen. And the look of joy on her face when I told her she could participate with her whole family is exactly why I advocate for inclusivity. 
I requested my park to order adaptive art and writing tools so that this program and others would be accessible to those with varying abilities. One of the young men with autism immediately grabbed the larger handle paintbrush because those with autism do have low grip strength at um, some of them have those diagnosis symptoms. These adaptive tools can make the difference between a family of being able to do an activity together or not at all because a lot of times they end up choosing not to do it. Not everyone can do it. There was just needs. There just needs to be intentionality and proper tools available. So not only did these tools benefit those present, but it brought to light possibilities for other people in their lives. This showed that opportunity and exposure are equally important. Uh, I think they passed around some adaptive tools already. If not, um, they'll be doing that now. These are adaptive tools that can assist someone with limited grip functions and low fine motor skills, such as like geriatric population. So you can hold it like this. You can hold it like, like this. So it keeps it moving. And you can see and feel that like you don't have to be holding these tools very tight together. And so this is also this is the active hands, and this is for if no if they don't have grip function at all. And so you would slide your hand through, put it around your wrist there, hold it, and now. Although I don't if I don't have grip function like those with a spinal cord injury, now they can paint. And then I also have this another adaptive tool that I don't think I only had like two, but this is a weighted glove. And what's really cool about that is that so with the shaking hands, I didn't have that at first, but that's the thing I reassessed. OK, what do I what needs are being needed or needs to be met? And so this can have the weights take out. And you can change um, the, the amount of weight you need. For the use for the bet the fits the best user. And. As you can see, the majority of these tools are not that expensive, so. I do recommend that um, that the Rochelle Park Service and other federal agencies try to have these in their program in their programming and in their parks on standby. And you can find this on Amazon or just by Googling. And I'll be concluding my presentation with recommendations um, that not Rocky that that not just Rocky, but a lot of other parks can do. And so I believe that programs should be accessible to all people and of varying abilities and the NPS should have adaptive programming training during park orientation. One in five and one according to the Center of Disease Control, one in four Americans have a disability. So I'll say that again, one in four Americans have a disability. And so training on how to treat individuals with varying disabilities is imperative in orientation, especially since INTERP is like right there doing these programs. I suggest creating adapt um, community centered programming like visitors creating a mural. I also suggest calculated advertising. It's very difficult to pilot programs if we if interns don't have the opportunity to actually advertise. None of my my only one program, which is the stretches, was ever advertised. So I hit those numbers on my own, just being like, hey, do you want to do this? Do you want to do this kind of thing? So it really it would have been more people potentially if there was that. So that's something I hear with a lot of parks. And then also just if you're going to do adapt, if you're going to do um, programs that are out out in the park, um, I do consider like maybe using clipboard if it's really windy, try to avoid windy areas, um, have a sink to clean up um, and use mul multiple tables. And so I'd like to thank Environment for the Americas for this second opportunity. And I want to thank my Rocky Mountain coworkers and supervisors, Jason Wolvington and Emily Wong for saying yes to all things I wanted to try out, like my adaptive programming, which was not originally a part of my um, job responsibilities. I requested them if I could do this in their park, which they approved. And for the freedom I was allowed to experiment with the outdoors with through different meetings of clays, coloring, crafts, painting, and these tools that make programs more accessible. And if you want to have that Excel sheet, you can email me and I can give that to you so we can do that for um, more people can know about these pro these uh, tools. So where will Art find you? Questions, yes. Hi, uh, I'm curious what personally inspired you to want to bring that kind of adaptive uh, programming into the park service and into your work and and like where did that passion come from? Um, so my since my under my 
my background is in arts in general. And the thing is, I've always been an advocate that everyone should have access to these um, to these opportunities. And what you're saying is what inspired me is that I've personally have worked with very various um, individuals. Like I've personally been uh, particularly with the geriatrics and I've worked at the VA um, intern. Um, actually, I'm going to intern soon, but <laughs> I'm volunteered at the VA and I've seen how um, the individual geriatrics individuals want to still do these things, but they can't. And so it's and it's just it's quite heartbreaking seeing them go like, well, I can't do this. It's like, yes, you can. I don't like saying I can't. I want to say yes. And so when they say um, I can't, I find a way. And so that's what inspires me because recreation is what brings people happiness. Like that's recreation is cooking. Recreation is painting. Recreation is taking a walk and recreation you know, is even watching a really good movie. And it's like, how can we still be able to do that? How can you still read? Like have a magnifying thing or whatever. Like there's a magnifying tool. Like it's, it's being able to say, yes, you can still enjoy your life. You are a lady after my own heart. So you're into the arts um, as well as this adaptive work. And I, and I have a background in sports. All right. <laughs> um, we're not going to get into what teams you follow. But, uh, but I would say that really a follow-up from the previous session is that you need, we need to connect you with our employee resource group that is complies of leaders and employees who have disabilities. And they serve as an advocacy network group that works to uh, make our uh, parks and public and facilities uh, more accessible, both from a physical and legal regulatory standpoint, but then also creating that ecosystem that provides the opportunities for people with disabilities. And there's also, we haven't gotten this employee resource group yet. I didn't get that done while I was with the Park Service, but we have to get one for everybody who's into the arts and theater and all of that, because there's quite a few National Park Service people that have this mm -hmm. interest, but they use it in different capacities in their jobs. So definitely we need to network with you to get you in contact with I those folks. I graduated December, so I'm looking for a nine. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Let me clean my mess up. No problem. This one? Yeah. Okay. That's and that's like here. I'll get that. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Tatiana. Next up is Amin is, is Bahi who was the biology assistant at Mount Rainier National Park. Please help me give it up for Amin. Oh. Yeah, I'm close. All right. We're here. All right, yeah, so my name is Amin Asbahi. I'm a rising senior at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, and I'm here to really present my internship experience at Mount Rainier National Park working as a biology assistant. Um, I'd like to begin by introducing the park. Now, this mountain, it goes by many names. There's been many different um, tribal cultures that have called the mountain home over time. And during the very beginning of my internship, I had an incredible experience to attend a salmon bake that the Nisqually tribe hosted for National Park employees. And they just, um, this man named Hanford told their story and their history. And he mentioned a word that they used to refer to the mountain. And I'm probably going to pronounce it wrong, so forgive me. But I believe it was Taqaoma, which means don't forget about the water. Now there's great wisdom in that. Living in the mountain as kind of like a giving mother, um, it was uh, a source of life and a source of glaciation that um, has both great ecological and cultural importance. And so just living literally on the side of the mountain this summer 
has been an incredible experience for me. Um, and like I alluded to earlier, I think it's important to mention that the land administered at Mount Rainier National Park is and has been since time immemorial the ancestral homeland of the Cowlitz, Muckleshoot, Nisqually, Puyallup, Squaxin Island, Yakima, and Coast Salish people. Um, this connection to the land is not history and it's still very palpable. And I'm going to revisit this later in my, in my presentation. But continuing on to my actual job description, I was based at Mount Rainier National Park, but I was an intern for the for NCCN, which we uh, ominously like to refer to as the network. It's the North Coast and Cascades Inventory and Monitoring Network, which conducts long-term monitoring research at seven different national parks across the Pacific Northwest, including Olympic National Park, Mount Rainier National Park, North Cascades, and others. Now, long-term monitoring is essential to making um, informed conservation decisions. And I'm going to use this glacier as an example. Now, this is a recent publication that came out of our geology team at Mount Rainier under the leadership of Scott Beeson, who's the head geologist in NCR at Mount Rainier. And it shows glacial recession over time. This data is only or is, is completely the product of 100 years of continued funding and research. And so although I wasn't studying glaciers, I was doing subalpine vegetation as I'll talk about in a minute. This is just an example uh, to why long-term monitoring is important. This data helps inform the park where to build roads, which is important from an economic sense uh, for visitors, but also is like extremely important ecologically. Um, okay, yeah, so continuing on to my research, I am in the very beginning, or the park is in the very beginning of a subalpine vegetation monitoring long-term research project, which is studying subalpine vegetation and how it may shift as the climate is shifting in the region. Subalpine vegetation just means really high up vegetation up on mountains. And Mount Rainier is famous for its wildflower meadows. It attracts millions of visitors a year. Mount Rainier gets 2 million visitors a year, which is crazy. And, um, so what I'm doing is I'm going up in these mountains and I'm assessing the herbaceous layer and I'm seeing what's present and its abundance. And I'm just contributing to this long-term data collection process by uh, collecting data for this summer. Now, this is an example of our methodology. So I'm not going to go super specific, but basically we set up plots and then in each plot we have a bunch of quadrats and then in each quadrat we look at what's there. So we'll, or, uh, we'll visually divide it up into uh, quarters and that helps us gain like a rough idea of what's 25% because it doesn't have to be super accurate or meticulous in a long-term research collection. It just has to be a rough estimate to see what's abundant, what's there and what's prevalent. So for example, that white flower is a glacier lily. I might look at this plot and say, oh, a glacier lily is 6% of the plot. Mark that down. And, that just happens at scale over the course of the summer. So that's an example of my field work. Um, this is a picture of me doing field work. It's beautiful. Um, I'm using a little hand lens to identify a species of vaccinium, which is huckleberry or blueberry. Um, another, my, my internship is multifaceted. And so while field work has been a part of it, it's only been available to me in the last few weeks because it's a mountain and it's up north and the snow just melted a few weeks ago. So before that, when I first got to Mount Rainier, I was also doing um, multiple different things. And one of them was hazard tree assessments, which is looking at trees that might fall on campgrounds or on uh, public buildings and like diagnosing them as hazardous, as sick. And I had to learn what parts of a tree or, or what makes a tree sick. So I learned how to diagnose a tree as unhealthy, looking for bark beetle rot, or root rot and things like that. In addition, I started to learn R. I had a tiny bit of R experience before the summer, and this is an example of my code. Now I feel much more comfortable with it. And one thing I really appreciated about this summer is that I came to my manager with hard goals of like gaining hard skills in science. And she's worked with me to 
do things like learning R, which weren't initially in my job description, but she's just really looking out for my professional development. So this is an example of me just building skills. So this is one example of a graph I made using ggplot. This is another graph and table I made. It's not very important to get into the actual content of this because it's just the beginning of long-term monitoring. And so we can't make hard conclusions about the prevalence and abundance of species in the area, but it just shows how I've been learning personally and like uh, developing my skills. In addition, I've had the opportunity to volunteer with other teams. Uh, this is the aquatics team. I was able to go out, sample dragonfly larvae, also uh, find and catch rough skin newts, which is super cool because I love wildlife. And so I was able to experience different departments in natural resources at Marinier, and that has been an amazing experience as well. Um, so I'm happy that Mr. McDonald is in the audience because this is me being a little bit disruptive, but if there's one thing I want you to take from my presentation, it's this. I, over the course of the summer, I felt that there's an incredible opportunity for Mount Rainier to be doing more with native cultures and indigenous peoples. And that's not to say that we're doing nothing. There are very hardworking employees in Mount Rainier that have worked meticulously to establish a Nisqually campground and some exhibits, but at a higher administrative level, there's a lot of hesitancy to build and establish that relationship. So I'm going to recommend two different um, models that I've experienced from doing internship exchanges and having dialogue with the Northwest Coast Indian Fisheries Committee as examples that we're doing in the Department of the Interior that could be directly applied to Mount Rainier. One of them is um, at San Juan Island National Historic Park. The American Camp Visitor Center was collaborated on directly with local native tribes, and they were given direct input on what to put there. And it's a very extensive um, exhibit in the park that shows art and crafts and their history, and it provides space to tell the truth. Um, this was partially recommended by the Fisheries Committee. And I think that if a very popular park like Mount Rainier, which like I said, has 2 million visitors a year, could implement something like this at a broad scale in all its visitor center, that would be tremendous for educating visitors on indigenous history. In addition, I had the chance to go to Lewis and Clark National Park, which the head of NCR there is actually a former Mosaics intern named Kayla, and she's worked to establish an ethnobotanical garden. Now at Mount Rainier, currently nobody, regardless of whether or not they're native, has a right to harvest um, anything from the park, despite the fact that harvesting um, different plants has been part of, an, of native culture for thousands of years. So what Kayla did at Lewis and Clark National Historic Park is establish an ethnobotanical garden. And that garden um, could be also implemented at Mount Rainier, just providing a space for indigenous peoples to come in and harvest uh, plants that are ethnobotanically important to them. So those are two suggestions that I think, not trying to be critical of Mount Rainier, but um, just options for Mount Rainier to um, tell the truth and provide space for native people in the future. Now, my future work will really just be continued data collection and making a few Instagram posts. And because I don't have much time, oh, the last slide isn't there. But I'd just like to thank everybody for listening. I'd like to thank my manager, Dr. Fallon, for being really supportive and also all my coworkers and also uh, EFTA, Environment for the Americas and the Mosaics and, Pro uh, Mosaics and Science Program and Shilda and all of you, so thank you. Hi, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. Um, I was just wondering of any prospects of uh, collaborations with uh, native and local tribes in the area in your research um, and like in the sector of ethnobotany or how could it inform uh, the monitoring project that you that you started to conduct this summer? That's a good question. I don't think that um, my data collection is really related at all 
to ethnobotany, like, like um, when I'm collecting data, we're just looking at the species that are present and how abundant they are. But I think it would be very interesting, maybe when uh, synthesizing the data to also put together, find which species are most present, present and maybe seeing which, what those uses, indigenous uses are of those plants. I think that could be a great idea. But yeah, as it's involved right now, it's really just me working with a botanist and just identifying the Latin names of those species and where they are. So um, the indigenous or Native American um, aspect of like those plants traditional uses is not really a part of our data collection process, but maybe it could be. This is like the main Good job. Thank you. Next up, we have Gia Flores Arellano, who was the public affairs intern at Mount Rushmore National Monument. Please help me welcome Gia to the stage. Hi, everybody. So this year, I had the opportunity to work at Mount Rushmore National Memorial. My project is very important because I created a communications plan for Native American Heritage Month and all the content that you will see will go up for November. A little bit about myself. I, oh, I am pursuing a bachelor's degree in art and my contribution is painting. I have a minor museum studies and I love creating artwork for my small business and painting. So important connections that I had this year was working with the culture bears. Not only did I, did I work with the culture bears, I also got to know them on a personal level and I thought that was very meaningful. Um, I learned a lot about their histories, their stories and their languages. I helped them set up the heritage village, did a lot of crowd control whenever they would go to lunch and then set up the sound system for the hoop dancers and photograph their culture presentations and their performances. So our goals are very important because we want to promote Native American Heritage Month and encourage people to learn more about the nine tribal nations and the 21 affiliated nations, um, highlight the culture bearers and what NPS staff is doing to uh, tell their stories, their histories, and share just the culture, and then advertise uh, what NPS is doing to um, promote Native American Her Heritage Month and Indigenous people. We also want to identify stereotypes that are going on in today's society and that the culture bears have faced, generate new interests for um, indigenous project that is a stone hoop garden, and then showcase Lakota, Nakota, Dakota heritage village development. So important connections. You will see two maps, uh, one, the one on the nine tribal nations, that is the uh, nine territories of the Lakota, Nakota, Dakota in South Dakota. And then you have the 21 affiliated tribal nations where um, Mount Rushmore is affiliated with and there are um, other parts of the state. The six grandfathers. Um, that is, uh, the six grandfathers was a very important um, photo that is prior to the carving of Mount Rushmore. Medicinal men were only allowed to go into um, the six grandfathers in order to have visions or important rituals. And then you have Ben Black Elk. Um, he is a very important Ogallala Lakota man. He was there for 27 years and he was the first culture bearer at Mount Rushmore. He would welcome people into the Black Hills in order, as a way of being respectful towards the Black Hills. And if it wasn't for Ben Black Elk, uh, Sequoia Crosswhite wouldn't be a culture bearer today at Mount Rushmore. So Sequoia Crosswhite got inspired. He is a performer and a dancer and a musician. And then we have Chief Red Cloud, who is uh, Daryl Red Cloud's fifth blood descended grandfather. And he wouldn't be a culture bearer either at Mount Rushmore. And he does a lot of culture presentations. So the culture bears, you guys had, I've talked a little bit about the culture bears. I work with all the culture bears this summer. And like I said, Daryl Redcloud is a culture presenter. Sequoia Crosswhite, he mixes da grass dance, music, and he gives culture presentations. And then we have the hoop dancers who are Star Chief Eagle and then Jasmine Fickrier Bell. They're actually sisters and their father, Dallas Chief Eagle passed away, but he uh, gave hoop dancing 
to the daughters and Jasmine dances with her daughters at Mount Rushmore. So this is the Lakota, Nakota, Dakota Heritage Village. I spend most of my time in there this summer. Um, as you see, there's a lot of important artifacts such as the bowl, that is a buffalo hide bowl. Lakota people would use that to eat and make dinner. Also, um, you will see the beaded work. That is what goes in Lakota people's regalia. And then you see Daryl Red Cloud's drum that he uses to perform in the teepee setups. It is an interactive that allows visitors to uh, interact and see what teepees would look like back then. So Native American Heritage Month is a month to honor the rich history and culture and traditions of Native people. And it is in November. So my project is gathering content and we wanna highlight the story on Mount Rushmore and the importance of indigenous people and who uh, Mount Rushmore is affiliated with and also highlight the importance of the Black Hills, which is Mount Rushmore and the surrounding areas. So our internal communication goals are um, to work with NPS partners and encourage collaboration, also raise awareness about indigenous topics and within the parks and surrounding areas. And we wanna generate projects such as working with culture awareness and sensitivity. Our external communication goals are enhancing the awareness of the South Dakota nine tribal nations and 21 affiliated nations. And we wanna share park development with educational and cultural like goals for K through 12 and universities, and then encourage industry, tourist industry and museums industry to promote the advertised indigenous programming for surrounding area of Mount Rushmore and other parts of the city. So in turn on our communication goals are also very important because oh my. sorry, <laughs> I'm just nervous. <laughs> Um, so our internal communication goals are very important because we want to work with other MPS partners, such as Wind Cave National Park and then Jewel Cave National Monument. And then our external audiences are, are really important because that's our like social media platforms and then local news and media audiences that go visit the memorial. Yeah. So part of my communications plan and also part of my uh, content that will go up for Native American Heritage Month. I work with the culture bearers and indigenous MPS staff to highlight the importance of stereotypical questions they get asked. And um, what is your costume? A lot of people would always ask the culture bearers and I it wasn't quite appropriate. So that's why regalia is the appropriate word was which is uh, what the culture bearers used to wear for like grass dances, um, powwows and other traditional like important events that they take away and Sioux Indian was also very very asked commonly asked and Sioux means snakes and enemies that's why Lakota Nakota Dakota means friends and allies so that is a proper way that Lakota people think um, they should be asked by so the Stone Hoop Garden is a very um, a new development project that is taking place at Mount Rushmore it is a indigenous project that um, is part of a garden to culturally signify the important locations of the Black Hills, such as Black Elk Peak, Wind Cave, Peshala, Burbu, and Devil's Tower. It is to incorporate the alignment of the several star constellations in the rising setting during the spring and fall equinox. So on the left side, you will see all the garden plants that will take place in the garden. They're either native to South Dakota and, and medicinal for indigenous people. And then on the right side, you see the sketch of the stone hoop garden, which is gonna take place right by the entrance at Mount Rushmore. So our outreach strategies, we wanna create and highlight um, a web page to advertise the culture bearers and their performances. Also distribute press releases so we can promote Native American Heritage Month. Use all NPS communication goals for visitors and learn more about culture presentations. And then we wanna, like I said, promote the culture bearers about when their performances and are taking place around the area or at Mount Rushmore. So my key takeaways. My key 
key takeaways are, are there, but the importance of this project was just getting to know all the culture bearers, the indigenous MPS staff in the history and the importance of like the Black Hills that it just holds such a huge significance within all the surrounding areas. And all these key takeaways are very important. And I, I would like to acknowledge my family at home for supporting me. Um, also the Shinna Bear Eagles, Rylance Break, the Culture Bears for supporting me and putting in so much thoughtfulness and just supporting me with the way that they helped me bringing me in and getting me, giving me the opportunity to learn more about their culture and the importance of showcasing this. And I'm very excited to see my project take a uh, part in November and all the Mount Rushmore Society who's supporting me right now. <laughs> Um, good job first, um, but I love your presentation and I do have a question for you as you created these relationships with the people. Mm -hmm. Do you have any suggestions or like plans or advice for your your coworkers to continue these relationships? Just speaking from experience, like I've, from the part that yeah. I'm at, they struggle with this, right? How to yeah. keep this relationship going once that person who did all that work moves on. Yeah. Well, um, this summer, uh, creating these relationships were very important because my project was based off um, getting to know the culture bearers more and Mount Rushmore is stepping in to highlighting the importance of indigenous people within the Black Hills. And that is why they brought me in to help promote more the importance of the culture bearers. One, once I like became an intern, I wasn't really aware of indigenous tribes until I became part of like helping them set up for their performances. And that's when I grew to learn more about the importance of the Black Hills and how sacred it is for Lakota people. So that is, this is like a stepping stone and shining a light within what we're, gonna, we're doing at Mount Rushmore. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um... I visited Mount Rushmore maybe five years ago and I didn't see a trace of like Indian culture at all. So I'm just like so happy you were there. And it's not really a question, but just kudos because it's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. I have one question. I missed the last time, so I'm, yes. I'm going to catch you on the disruption piece. We got to talk. So um, when you were at Mount Rushmore, did you encounter any um, uh, issues regarding the fact that the sacred mountain had been desecrated in the eyes of some of the indigenous people were putting the uh, images of the four presidents up and, and how did the, and if you did, how did the culture bearers, how do they reconcile those yeah. issues? And then uh, is the park working on any reconciliation pieces mm -hmm. around that? Well, the culture bearers, um, the reason that they're there working for Mount Rushmore is to shine away from like what happened in the past and educate people about the importance of why they're there. A lot of people who visit the memorial are usually don't even know much about indigenous culture. And when they help like do those presentations, they get the acknowledgement of the realization of the importance of how um, the six grandfathers, which was the prior to the carving, it will always be the six grandfathers. And, you know, that's why they're there. And the importance of them working there is just to like educate people. I mean, I've, I've worked with them closely. I've heard the questions that people usually ask them, but they still stand high in order to properly educate people. So there's been commonly asked questions like that, but Mount Rushmore is trying to shine away uh, from that and being inclusive within the nine tribal nations of South Dakota and the 21 affiliated tribal nations. Yeah. Thank you, Gia. Up next is Miko del Castillo, who was the Natural Resource Management Assistant at Mississippi National River and Recreation Areas. Uh, just a reminder, you have 10 minutes and there will be a two minute question and answer period. 
Here's your clicker. Thank you. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Miko Del Castillo, and I'm a 2023 Mosaics and Science intern for the Environment for the Americas. The last few months of this internship have absolutely flown by, and I'm excited to be here today to share my findings with you all. My site was at the Mississippi National River and Recreation Area, or the MIS, located in Minnesota. Being born and raised in the Twin Cities, I was fortunate enough to be within a 20 minute drive from my house in Minneapolis to the park's headquarters in St. Paul. This park spans a 72 mile stretch of the river from Ramsey, which is that first star, to Hastings, which is the second one near Cannon River. This park is considered a partnership park, which means out of the 54,000 acres that are technically within our boundaries, we own about 67 of. The rest of the area is composed of regional and city parks, wildlife refugees, and other natural areas. One of the more striking things about this park is how it partially exists within urban confines. This park goes through both of the Twin Cities, Minneapolis and St. Paul, and this results in a pretty unique intersection between the bustling city life and the nature that surrounds it. Our park is actually in that lower picture, right where that blue star is, that's our headquarters. So it's right on the Mississippi downtown. Um, and the part of the park that I've enjoyed the most is the sheer amount of biodiversity at a glance. Whether it be a rare mussel species, reintroduced river otter, or a thriving bald eagle population, which is one of the highest in the lower 48 states, this park and the Mississippi enables so much life to exist around it. But what makes this area such a good habitat for wildlife? in particular, our bald eagles. One of the biggest factors is the abundance of floodplain forests that surround the Mississippi River. Floodplain forests often accompany river valleys as these low-lying areas host vegetation that are well adapted to survive the seasonal flooding. Most often in these places, you will find tree species like silver maple, green ash, American elm, and eastern cottonwood. These trees often grow dominantly in the forest canopy, especially eastern cottonwoods. Their shallow root systems span out farther than other trees, enabling them to retain water and nutrients more efficiently in this setting. Mature cottonwood trees actually host about 80% of our bald eagle population, as being in the tallest trees is typically very advantageous for spotting potential meals and threats alike. Our cottonwood abundance seems to be a large reason as to why we have so many thriving bald eagle pairs, averaging about one nest per mile of the park. But as of recently, there have been many issues pertaining to the trees in these forests, in these pockets of forest near the river. Unfortunately, the composition of floodplain forests on the Mississippi have been heavily impacted by a variety of problems. The emerald ash borer has single-handedly removed the presence of mature green ash trees leading to a massive loss in the floodplains canopy. Dutch elm disease has respectively affected the majority of the American uh, elm population. And if this wasn't already concerning enough, eastern cottonwood trees, the most dominant trees in the uh, forest are simply not regenerating as they have in the past. Here on the right is a photo that I took at Crosby Farms, a regional park inside the mist boundaries that I spent a lot of my time doing field work at. On either side of the walking path at any given time, you will see a ton of stuff like this. And this is actually all of the vegetation is uh, silver maples regenerating. But there was rarely ever any cottonwood saplings that were starting to regrow. It was rare that we found any within the forest. And this has created a need for the better understanding of floodplain forests in the area. One of the studies hoping to learn more about this issue is the ASK project, or Adaptive Silviculture for Climate Change. The Adaptive Silviculture for Climate Change project is a nationwide collaborative effort geared towards understanding how trees and forests will be affected throughout the progression of a warming climate. In Minnesota, this research is occurring at the previously mentioned Crosby Farms and will be until 2040. I spent a few weeks helping out the University of Minnesota's silviculture lab as they conducted the experiment. A typical day for us involved vegetation sampling in the 24 fenced in plots. Um, we would randomly throw a quadrat, which is the PVC frame on the right, in each cardinal direction and plot center while identifying any plant species that existed within the square. We would then take tree regeneration surveys within the plots by heading 45, 135, 
and 225 degrees from plot center and noting any issues with the surrounding trees overall health while taking notice of any herbivory. And surveying for herbivory was very valuable for feeding into the recommendations for my main project, which involves beaver and their impacts on the Mississippi. The beaver project has been active since the summer of 2020. After hearing concern from multiple partners of the park regarding beaver and their tendency to hinder eastern cottonwood restoration, it was decided that it's necessary to gain a better understanding of beaver ecology within the Mississippi River's National Park Service unit. Typically, beaver have been studied in Ponder Lake systems, but rarely are they studied in a large river uh, system that runs through urban corridors. There is little to no information on the beaver populations that exist in our corridor, and even less pertaining to urban beaver populations in general. This is crucial to understand in the context of better forest management. How and where to replant cottonwoods is a prevalent issue in the park, along with managing the beaver who are mowing down saplings that are replanted. I, on the right is a photograph of one of the previously mentioned restoration efforts. On an eight-year-old project in North Mississippi Regional Park, beaver were able to breach the fenced plot during the spring flood season and effectively mowed down all 50 cottonwood saplings that were replanted. They couldn't, they couldn't even get them through the, back to the fence. They just kind of cut them down and left. Um, so my personal objectives during this internship was to study the foraging ecology of beaver. By observing the beaver's herbivory patterns along transects while noting what they choose to take and where, we can compare what is available to what they've eaten and get a better idea of their overall dietary habits. Looking into the browse patterns and regeneration issues side by side will give us a better overall idea of their connection. And so, my portion of work really surrounded vegetation sampling. The process for this part of the beaver project entailed completing three transects at Crosby Farms Regional Park. For more context on the site, Crosby Farm has a lake. And between the Crosby Lake and the Mississippi River is a stretch of floodplain forest where we perform the transects. By putting these transect lines between the two lakes, we can establish a gradient of how far into the forest that beaver will forage from their lodges near the water's edge. We managed to multitask and do two different surveys throughout the transect lines. The first was to examine foraging patterns. After we flagged out the transects route, we followed in a 100 meter tape from point to point while looking at trees within the meter, uh, meters space on either side of the tape. We would note any trees that showed signs of herbivory and list what kind of animal did it. Deer herbivory would typically appear towards the tops of saplings, while beaver left more clear cuts at what we referred to as beaver height, around three feet or lower. On more mature trees, they would leave very obvious signs of girdling. For our second survey, we studied tree regeneration. At 100, 400, 700, and 1100 meters, we would stop at each respective point and do variable radius plots. Using a prism to establish which trees were considered in or out of the sample, we would take trees that were in and note the type of tree, diameter at breast height, overall health of the tree, and if there were any signs of herbivory. Since these were the first transects that anyone had sampled for the beaver project, it was both fun and challenging to get down the general methodology. Finding what worked and what didn't work was super rewarding and will be used in future sampling around the Mississippi. As for results, since we literally just finished the transects last week, it's hard to have any concrete conclusions from our work. We are expected to begin having preliminary conclusions by around 2025. What we know now is that the answer is going to be complex. From a survey in 2021, we can assume beaver populations in the Mississippi are not uniform, and the National Park Service corridor in particular hosts a lot of heterogeneity. Therefore, we cannot expect a uniform effect from beaver, and we need to posture our research accordingly. Ultimately, more time and hard work will be needed to determine the ecological impacts that beaver have on tree regeneration. But with this in mind, we can start to think about what we hope will develop from the study. In the long term, we hope to establish a monitoring plan for beaver in the Mist Corridor because there are enough of them and we aren't aware of their population trends and other ecological aspects. Where are they currently living and how many of them are living there? What mechanisms are driving the population numbers up or down? 
Are human constructed dams in the Mississippi prohibiting their movement? And are they affecting the regeneration of these eastern cottonwood trees? The answers to these questions and more are still being found, and it's important to have additional knowledge on the topic. By doing more cache surveys, vegetation transects, and camera trapping, we can learn more and gain a better understanding of Mississippi beaver. Eventually, the data we collect will determine what they impact for better or worse. We can then use this information to better our forestry practices and reduce unwanted herbivory. To summarize, my time at the park included carrying out vegetation browse transect samplings, evaluating the impacts that beaver have on floodplain forest regeneration, assisting in vegetation transects for the ASK project, adding suggestions to revise methodology throughout the process, performing tree regeneration surveys and assisting in muscle related research projects, reviewing and entering camera trap content into data sheets, and collaborating with seasonal rangers, University of Minnesota researchers, and other park service staff. Here are my references, and here are my acknowledgments. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Any questions? Any <laughs> questions? Yeah, hi. Um, I actually found this very interesting. I just wanted to know what were some of the failed methods that you guys uh, had to scrap? <laughs> so basically, for the ASK project, since it's also at Crosby Farms, the plots that we had originally, the transect lines actually ran through. So it wasn't like sensible to have both of the transects run through the plots. And, you know, they're doing two separate um, research, more research. But we were able to move the transect lines over a little bit. So they were going through. And also, there was just a ton of stinging nettle, wood nettle, ticks. It was awesome. It was a really good time. Yeah, well, I, I really loved your presentation, and I feel like you were able to tell it in a very compelling way because of the use of the beaver video. <laughs> and I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to how this experience uh, impacted your your understanding of storytelling and the importance of that in in some of the work that the service does and and in climate change in general. Yeah, well, I think it just gave me a more on the ground experience for you know, everything um, science related. I mean, I love natural science and being able to get my first field experience was a huge part of like my overall fulfillment in this job. Like it really gave me a better indication of what I wanted to do in the long term for my career, which was so awesome. All right, thank you. <laughs> so we're going into our next session of DHA presentations. How exciting. First, we have Drew Lister, an Indian Youth Service Corps intern at the Office of Native American Affairs. So come on up, Drew. You'll have 10 minutes to present and two minutes for question and answer. Before, through, before I go through my presentation, I'd like to acknowledge the Net Coach Tank people, also known as the Anacostian people, and the Piscataway people who have called Washington, D.C. their home. So Yate, hello. I'm Drew Lister. I'm Dene. My maternal grandparents are uh, Grace Sasano from Brooklyn, New York, Elsie Lister from Dilcon, Arizona, and my maternal grandparents are Carmine Fasano from Brooklyn, New York, and Earl Lister from Dilcon, Arizona. So I'm actually half Italian and half Native American. So in my Native American culture, you're supposed to first introduce your matrilineal grandparents as the women are heads of the family. So filed by your maternal grandparents. Uh, many people do this to show you where you're from and try to make a connection about who you are. For us Navajos, we greet, you, we greet each other in clans. So my clans are Belagana and Tohani. So it means I'm white and I'm born from the near water. And this is how I usually introduce myself. So I'm an intern at the Office of Native American Affairs. I work as a tribal liaison. I graduated from the University of Washington in 2019, and I began working with the National Park Service in 2021. And I'm an enrolled member of the Navajo Nation. 
So first, I wanted to go through an overview of our national parks. So we have 423 parks, 23 national scenic and national historic trails, and 64 wild and scenic rivers. And we have over 300 million visitors per year. Uh, so the amount of indigenous tribes that we consult with in 2021 and 2020, 2020 and 2021, which was uh, a report over COVID years, was that we consulted with 302 tribes, 47 Alaska Native villages, and two ANCSA corporations. So I'm wondering, a lot of people probably don't know what ANCSA corporations are, but it's the Alaska Native Claim Settlement Act in 1971 where it made 12 regions into Alaska corporations in exchange for land. So there's actually one, only one reservation in Alaska. So going on to tribal entities, um, there are 574 recognized federal tribal entities, which are described as tribes, bands, and nations. But the National Park Service also recognizes state recognized tribes, Alaska corporations, Native Hawaiians, and Alaskan villages. I want every park to know that we want to work with every tribal entity. So what do I do? Um, at the Office of Native American Affairs, I'm a tribal liaison and consultation is pretty much a conference between the federal government and the National Park Service to discuss proposals before they are finalized. Um, as a tribal, a tribal liaison, we try to maintain a good relationship with tribes and try to give our indigenous nations as many opportunities within our parks. So how is this implemented? A lot of people discussed how some uh, tribal relations are still improving, but in Secretarial Order 3342, uh, the federal government is required to consultate with all these tribes and to offer collaborative management or opportunities for tribal entities. Um, and this is mandated by President, President Biden. So at the Office of Native American Affairs, we represent tribes. Uh, we support policy review, implementation, and a robust working relationship with Native American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, and Alaska Native communities. So there are a lot of challenges with tribal consultation. You know, one of the most challenging things is that tribes lack capacity. You know, National Park Service has so much money and all these tribal governments probably have around one employee to do around 10 employees jobs. So when the federal government is sending emails to tribal leaders, they have to skim through a bunch of emails for proposals and many other things, and it might get lost in the bunch. So we have to be better about sending follow-up emails. Another thing is interpretation of indigenous peoples within our parks. We're gonna know that a lot of our visitors really don't know that every national park has a story to them, an indigenous story. So we want to incorporate most of our tribal neighbors stories and we hope that it will keep improving. And lastly, we are creating uh, a confidence to tribal consultation right now. And we have set up multiple conferences throughout the year that specifically specialize in training employees to interact with tribal nations and how to effectively create a form of consultation. So I actually just went to a training in Alaska, which focused on different Alaska native laws. And it, it was very, very interesting, but there also was a conference in Big Cypress Preserve. And I also attended one in Apostle Islands in Wisconsin, which was very, very good as well. And there's gonna be one in Hawaii in the next week. So these are all great, conferences for employees to be able to learn more about the tribal people in their areas. And another thing that we want to do is when we're meeting some of these tribal members, we want to bring a gift for them, you know, maybe, maybe food, you know, somewhere, some, something that talks about the person that you are. Um, so some consultation act outcomes that we've done is that like I've been saying, we're improving the tribal voices within our communities. So, for example, at Fort Larned National Historic Site, we got, um, excuse me, sorry, uh, we got suggestions from the culturally significant tribes within the area, as well as suggestions from Hauska University professors, and this has led to a total redesign of their museum. 
Um, also, we are working on co-stewardship and co-management projects. So down below, you can see uh, National P Park employees at the Grand Canyon that are tribal members that are working on Desert View Heritage Project. So this Desert View Heritage Project is a very exciting site that will allow the 11 traditionally associated tribes of the Grand Canyon to tell their stories and to provide information about their view of the park. Not only will they be relevant in the park, but they will allow these tribes to provide tourism opportunities to come to their homelands and um, will develop a better relationship for the future. And I'm also talking about co-management. So Acadia National Park has this program called the Acadia Sweetgrass Project. And there's actually a famous book about it called Braiding Sweetgrass. That is a very, very good book. If anybody wants to read it, it does a lot of great things. Um, it talks a lot about this thing called indigenous knowledge, um, which a lot of people are bringing up too. It should be well incorporated into our system and is actually recognized now, which has been a long, long fought. So the Acadia project is one of the most relevant co-management projects that the general public has heard. The study shows the difference between Western science and indigenous knowledge. So Western science can be described as something that's empirical and has to be proven, while indigenous knowledge is something that sometimes cannot be explained, but is proven through stories passed down through generation to generation. This specific project has helped the Wabanaki Confederacy reclaim their indigeneity and will further revitalize their culture through maintaining their sacred plant sweetgrass. The chart on the right shows the distinct differences between the two scientists, the botanists and the indigenous gatherer. Uh, the indigenous botanist in the blue pot shows that it's been able to grow it as big, almost as big as three times. So some of my recommendations for tribal consultation. Um, we need more tribal representation within our parks. That's a very big thing that we need to work on. Um, Building park housing near our tribal reservation homes. Uh, tribal members prefer not to be too far from home. So this will allow indigenous employees to stay close to their homes and provide meaningful work within their parks. So for example, at uh, Cameron, Arizona, along uh, in Grand Canyon National Park, we're trying to design a project that will be able to allow more tribal employees to live within those lands and to work a little bit closer to the Grand Canyon. And also, we've been talking a lot about, you know, maintaining relationships with tribal members. If a tribal member asks you to attend a gathering outside of work, really take that into thought because, you know, you don't make a friend after one meeting. You have to meet them at their own homelands. We can't just ask them to come to our parks because it's a little bit far from their homes. So if somebody asks you to go to powwow, go out at work hours and go try to make that meaningful relationship. It will go a long way and keep maintaining that relationship. And lastly, you know, providing career advancements for our tribal members. In a period where a master's degree is pretty much needed, there needs to be other ways of getting indigenous people into the park service without such degrees. There needs to be better ways of career advancement within these regions instead of hopping from park to park. You know, a lot of people go through career advancements from getting away and going to a different park, but there's got to be a different way of trying to get opportunities within their own homelands. So I believe there's going to be some work done on these issues and there has been, but I think these are the biggest barriers that we are facing in the National Park Service. So thank you everyone for listening for what I do. And thank you so much for Dorothy Firecloud and the team at Environment for the Americas. Any questions? Thank you so much. I really liked your presentation. Um, so I worked in the regional office and it's kind of a struggle to remind NPS staff that national parks are native land. And I just want to ask, like, how do you deal with that? How do you like remind them of that? Or just, you know, along those lines. And I also wanted to plug for everyone. There's a podcast called Parks by um, Marty 
sorry, Mary Martis and Cody Nelson. It's literally just called Parks if you look it up on Spotify or um, Apple Music or wherever you listen to your podcast. And it tells a story of, um, you know, national parks on an indigenous front. Um, so yeah, what I, I would love to hear from on how that is for you, because I know it's hard for me. I think personally, when I go to some of these national parks, I always ask like, do we have a tribal relations with the people that we're, we are at? And like, there's a story for everybody. And I really like, there's most museums, it talks about the history, but sometimes they don't mention our indigenous counterparts. And it really hits home for me because, you know, our creation is from some of these sacred places, which are our national parks. So it's about asking very deep questions, you know, asking them, what are you doing? Like, and these questions that need to be asked. And that's what we're trying to do at the Office of Native American Affairs. Thank you, Drew. Next up is Tony Ramos, LHIP intern and history science intern at Padre Island National Seashore. Just make sure. Mm -hmm. Just make sure to. Oh my God, I'm tall. I look over there. Yeah. See, now I broke the ice, guys. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name. Why is this not? Cool. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Tony Ramos. I am the history science intern at the Padre Island National Seashore. I represent the Division of Sea Turtle Science and Recovery. I attend the University of Houston and I am an environmental geoscience and chemistry student. So the Padre Island National Seashore was first established in 1962. It's located south of Corpus Christi, Texas and is titled as the world's largest undeveloped barrier island. The Kemp's Ridley Sea Turtle Restoration and Enhancement Program and other Kemp's Ridley projects of Texas are long-term and cooperative with many partners in the USA and Mexico. Okay, so my research was assessing the importance of coastal geomorphology and its impact on the Kemp's Ridley nesting site selection within the Padre Island National Seashore. Now this was broken down into thorough uh, research on the Kemp's Ridley species, geological history and geomorphology research of the Padre Island, thorough fieldwork analysis, ArcGIS mapping to assess nesting site selections within the seashore, and digital elevation modeling and light detection and ranging. Okay, so in total, there were 60 miles studied by biologists in 60 mile marker increments. This ends at the Mansfield Channel uh, with the man-made jetties. The Kemp's Ridleys originated in the Americas uh, about three to four million years ago and diverged as species from the Ridley genus. Um, prior to 1880, they were an enigma to scientists and scientists knew very little about the species and often assumed that they were a hybrid between the loggerhead sea turtle and the green sea turtles. Uh, they are the second smallest species. They're only about 80 to 100 pounds. They have an olive green colored carapace that is about two feet wide and circular shape. That's the best way to, to like specify which species they are. And they originate in the Gulf of Mexico, but can be as found as far as Nova Scotia. Um, in 1947, excuse me, in 1947, the Mexican engineer named Andres Herrera travels to Rancho Nuevo, Mexico and discovers the first documented Arribada, um, which is the mass synchronized event of female nesting turtles that come ashore. That day, there were 40,000 sea turtles that came ashore and nested about a quarter million of eggs. So that's a lot of eggs. Afterwards, that is a heavy decline in uh, population due to um, egg harvesting, poaching, negligent fishing, shrimping activities, and the egg numbers drop dramatically to less than a thousand in the years coming after. In December 1970, the Kemp's Ridley species is declared endangered. So nesting site selection is very unique to the Kemp's Ridleys. There are three phases. The first phase is beach selection, female emergence, and nesting site selection. The first two phases occur offshore and are triggered by a unique set of nesting stimuli, high wind speeds, cool temperatures, offshore tides, and a particular beach profile. Um, and as mentioned, female emergences often congregate, and it's also known as an aribada, where a significant amount of sea turtles emerge, and they only occur during the daytime. This is a very unique phenomena to the Ridley genus. Now, nesting site selection is a very uh, unique experience, and I should also mention that aribadas increase the survivalhood and increase the mating for the turtles. So this is very 
impotent for them to, you know, do well. Um, so site fidelity for the turtles is what makes nesting placement so unique for each individual turtle. Good site fidelity, according to scientists, is about 15 kilometer range. Um, and it's also important that too high of the nesting could lead to predation and disorientation for the hatchlings to return back to the water, while too low could mean exposure to erosion. Okay, now stick with me. This is going to get a little complex. So the youngest geological feature is Padre Island. It's about 4,500 years old, and in relation to the Earth, it's a very young geological feature. This was determined by radiocarbon dating of shells. At the 18,000 years ago, about at the end of the Ice Age, this is at the high uh, glaciers are melting, the sea levels are rising exponentially, and the Gulf of Mexico shoreline is 50 miles offshore than what we see now. At this time, there are Texas rivers that are depositing sediments onto the current submerged continental shelf. 4,500 years ago, the genesis of Padre Island, at the end of the Holocene period, the sea level rising is still continuing and the flooded river, there are like flooded river valleys that are now becoming the modern estuaries and bays of Texas. 2,800 years ago, uh, sea levels are starting to stabilize, the sandbars and shoals are merging offshore, and eroded sand is carried into shore as sandbars. Strong winds and waves deposit sand to form a barrier islands, like as a chain, and longshore drifts, which are known as parallel to the shoreline, would deposit sand at the end of the barrier island to create a spit accretion. So geomorphology is very unique to every barrier island, and geomorphic zones are impacted by a dynamic system, beach shape, sand supply, rising sea levels, and side of waves. In addition, the unique Gulf of Mexico shoreline is concave, and so that influences longshore drifts that makes it a uh, convergent zone. In total, 986 nesting sites were studied from 2016 through 2022, uh, and, I, and I studied them as a single symbol versus a hotspot. And we noticed that there was a hotspot at the 35 through 40 mile marker. And as I did that, I also studied false crawls, uh, which occurs when the first two phases of nesting happen, but for numerous reasons, such as predation or poor nesting conditions, the turtles are unable to complete nesting. And so 83 cases were analyzed from 2016 through 2022. And just like before, the 35 through 30, 40 mile marker uh, has a hotspot. Now, with the collaboration of Texas A&M University Corpus Christi's Water and Environmental Systems Analysis Lab, I conducted LIDAR, or excuse me, digital elevation modeling data to assess the to beach topography or elevation profile. This was on the North Beach due to permitting, and this has a mo like a moderate sand dune height and it's narrower beach shorelines, which is typically ideal for sea turtle nesting. Um, and I also did a comparison between Rancho Nuevo and, and Padre Island to visualize the um, what the profiles look like. And so we noticed that at both of these, they both have a high energy environment. So it's constantly changing. And there's fine grained sand, and there's a similar shoreline length and similar elevation profile. Okay, so I did a field analysis from the 35 to 45 mile marker. And we noticed at the 35 mile marker seen in that top image, there's high nesting sand dunes with fine grained sand. As we continue downward, we notice that there are more anomalies in the sand profile. And we see that there's, in the image above, if you look closely at that white part of the oyster, it's an oyster fragment, which could mean that this is an exposed bay bottom deposit. Um, at the 42 mile marker, we begin to see there's a lot of heavy shell content, which could also mean that this was in a potentially bay bottom exposure. This indicates that these were former inlets. These are heavy littoral drift influences, and this is an exposed bay bottom. Um, at the 50 through 60 mile marker, there is a high variability in the beach width as it goes from narrow to dramatically wide. At the 55 mile marker, we see that there's tall, steep sand dunes, which means that they're not very stable and they're more uh, susceptible to ex like exponential erosion rates. At the 59.5 mile marker, we begin to see the negligent activities of dredging. We see shell hash, which is a direct result of dredging, which has broken up tiny particles of shells. And then we can see clay balls, which, you know, is a different soil structure than sand, and it has more like porosity. At the 60 mile marker, which is right next to the jetties, we see that there's exposed hardened sandstone. This is a direct result of dredging, and this is exponential erosion rates. Overall, this is just unacceptable nesting activities for the sea turtles, and it's no longer habitable. 
So as mentioned before, we see that there's high nesting activity at the 35 through 45 mile markers. Um, and we also realize that there's a convergence zone. And that has mentioned before, a convergence zone occurs when parallel shorelines meet in the center and they like just cause like a drift in the shores. And so I like to describe the island as like a bow and arrow where the bow is the island shape and the arrow or the strings would be the convergence zone. So you have these two shapes with the 102.9 degrees and the 72.8 and the arrow would represent the convergence zone, which is about perpendicular. And that is at the 27 degree north latitude, which is the central section of Padre Island National Seashore. Okay, and so we know that high nesting occurs at the 35 through 40 mile marker, followed by the 30 through 35 mile marker and the 40 through 50 mile marker. Nesting congregates, but it's still distributed out the island and it's best described as a string of pearls. With the influence of uh, the unique geomorphology, there's a, a definite uh, convergence zone, and I think that it should be further discussed and um, studied more to understand how the sea turtles are influenced by convergence zones. And overall, the unique dynamic system that changes so frequently that it becomes an animal of itself. And in addition, we need to begin to assess the geomorphology with more thorough digital elevation modeling, light detection and ranging data, assessing the sand consolidation, which is measuring how compact with uh, the sand is through pressure. Dang. Um, monitor tides and convergent zones of nesting hotspots. And of course, this research would not have been possible without the following people and organizations. References. Come on. This is not funny anymore. Okay, I guess that's it. Um, cool. Any questions, friends? Woo! There's really nothing. I got one. Um, I loved your presentation. Thank I you. thought it was really well articulated. Um, so from my understanding of sea turtles, I don't know if this happens in Kemp's Ridley sea turtles, but I know that there's a phenomena going on where because of rising sand temperatures, a lot of times most of the eggs uh, that sea turtles lay are, yeah, are largely yeah. female. I was wondering if that occurred at your island and yeah. if there was a solution that you guys took. So yeah, great that. question. Um, and those of you that don't know, we have a phrase that are chicks are hot, dudes are cool. So <laughs> female turtles usually prefer, or they're more likely to be born as female if they have hotter sand temperatures and males are cooler. And so the National Seashore implements this protocol where um, for every egg nesting site found, there is uh, incubation room. And so we excavate the eggs and we typically aim for hotter temperatures because we want more females in the water. Um, this is gonna raise the population levels. So we prefer it, but with climate change occurring, it is becoming a bigger concern. Um, and in, in addition to that, it's also just becoming unideal for nesting site con conditions. So that's a fantastic question. Cool, yes. Hi, um, so you alluded to this a little bit when you're talking about the geomorphic history, that sandbars are really dynamic. And I was curious um, how much of the changes at the beach you saw were from sort of just natural geomorphic changes versus human caused activities like dredging. And then um, what are the differences in dune con conservation in response to those different causes? So that's always like a tricky battle because every geologist has their own way to like take matters into their own hands. And I think the biggest concern is that, and I think it's also important to express that dynamic systems, if one aspect of it changes, it will do everything else to bring it back into order. So for everything that changes, everything will alter itself. Um, so it's it's constantly changing. And it, in, a, in an essence, without the influence of humans, it can still regulate itself. But because we live in Texas or because, you know, the seashore is in Texas, Texas is, um, they have drivable beaches. And so at this point, there is no longer an embryonic dune, which means that at the base of the sand dunes, there's no longer a development area. And so when it gets constantly compacted, that's what makes a bigger concern, in my opinion, for nesting conditions. And in addition, when you have like man-made influence, such as like the Mansfield Channel, where they have like negligent um, dredging activities, 
This is an influence as the jetties have now altered the convergent zone and the littoral drift influences. So now you have higher um, energy that's coming downward and now it's not dissipating in the manner that it should be. Cool. Thank you. You got it. Oh. Oh my gosh. Thank you. I'm going to get this out of the way. Of that. Okay. All right. Next up, we have Natural Resource Management Assistant from Klondike Gold Rush National Historic Park, Isabella Yala Pregada. Just make sure to look at the bottom right for timing. Oh, cool. Hi everyone, my name is Isabella Yala Pragada. I am a master's student at Indiana University studying environmental science and public affairs. And this summer I was the mosaics and science intern at Klondike Gold Rush National Historic Park. So a little bit of context on Klondike Gold Rush National Historic Park, which I will now be referring to as Cligo because that is a very long name. Um, the park was established in 1976 to commemorate the Klondike Gold Rush of 1898 and 1899, as well as its associated structures, trails, and historic landscapes. And the park is located at this red arrow in Skagway, Alaska, at the northern terminus of the Lynn Canal, so it's in a fjord. But something that I find particularly interesting about the landscape as a conservationist is that it is a highly biodiverse region um, within a relatively small land size, around 53 square kilometers. Um, and it's the only area in Southeast Alaska where coastal temperate rainforest uh, directly meets interior boreal ecosystems. So this means that the park contains a large degree of biodiversity. As you can see here, um, the pink on that map uh, is boundary zones where in the rest of Alaska, these two ecosystems are separated by unveg unvegetated, largely ice capped regions. Slide, please. There we go. So I spent my summer conducting coastal waterbird surveys, which was developed in 2003 to monitor the occurrence, distribution, abundance, and habitat associations of birds of the Taya Inlet, with particular attention paid to breeding and migratory bird species. So Southeast Alaska generally is a stopover site for thousands of migratory bird species every season who stop in the region to rest and recharge before going to their final um, birding and nesting sites further north. Um, but more generally, the surveys that the, that the park conducts on its flora and fauna are an important part of the responsible stewardship of the ancestral homeland of the Tlingit people, um, who, in my opinion, are the land's original, enduring, and rightful stewards. So my analysis compared two different methodologies, a pre-2021 and post-2021 procedure. The environmental data that was collected pre and post-2021 shifted a little bit. Um, most of the environmental data pre-2021 was observed data, um, but while some of that data was preserved, um, more precise data was collected through a NOAA uh, weather station, and that included air temperature, wind speed, and gust direction, as well as calculated tides. An adjustment was also made to the biological data that was collected pre and post 2021. So pre-2021, um, observers collected data on the type of species, the sex, the age, as well as breeding pairs. But as the birding expertise of these um, largely survey volunteers shifted over time, the biological data was simplified just to record the counts of bird species that we saw, as well as the individuals within those bird species. Um, the gear that we used stayed the same between the two methodologies, so we just relied on binoculars, a spotting scope, as well as a birding guide. And as for the frequency, that stayed the same as well. I was conducting bird surveys once a week during spring migration from mid-April to the end of May, um, and once every two weeks from June to early August. 
Now, this is a map comparison of the two methodologies. Um, the methodology and the observation points shifted slightly due to changes in the observational units, um, largely due to the growth of trees and shrub, shrubs that alter where we could um, stop to count the birds. Um, but the important thing that I want you to take from this map is that my analysis spoke, focused specifically on units three, four, and five of the pre-2021 procedure and B and C of the post-2021 procedure. Question formulation. Oh, first, what birds did we see? So out of the nearly 40 species of birds that we saw this season, um, we saw marble merlets, bald eagles, surf scoters, arctic terns, great blue herons, and belted kingfishers, which are the species that are of particular interest to me. And in the blue, I highlighted the clinket names. So question formulation. My supervisor wanted to know if this will work. My supervisor essentially wanted to know if there was a difference in the species abundance and species richness between the old procedure 2017 and 2019 and the new procedures 2021 to 2023. We admitted 2020 due to staffing shortages and um, due to COVID that prevented the survey being uh, performed in that year. And to put this in statistical analysis terms, when I ran my ANOVA, the hypothesis that I was testing for is a null hypothesis that the means of the old procedure are the same as the means of the new procedure. Okay. Richest results, the number of species. As you can see, there is small variability in the total number of species seen between the old and new procedures as well as within the years. This will work. You'll see that once I ran my ANOVA analysis, I found a relatively high p-value of 0 0.18, which means that I failed to reject the null hypothesis. And in normal terms, this essentially means that the means of the old procedure, the number of species seen, was the same as the mean for the new procedure. So we failed to reject the null hypothesis. And moving on to abundance results are the total individuals present. You can see that there's a much higher variability here um, in the individuals observed from year to year, as well as between the old and new procedures. I ran an ANOVA test for this as well, which when it pops up, you'll see that it's also a relatively high p-value of 0 0.52, which means that we fail to reject the null hypothesis and that the means of the old and new procedures are the same. There we go. So I also highlighted marble merlets specifically, also known as Chaik and Plinket. Um, and the variability between the old and new procedures was relatively ex the same, except for an increase in marble merlet populations in 2023, which is very exciting because if any of you are from the Pacific Northwest, you know that um, marble merlet populations are decreasing um, throughout the Pacific Northwest, with the exception of Alaska. However, a little bit counterintuitively, after I ran my ANOVA, I also got a high p-value of 0. 175, meaning that the mean of the populations of marble merlets was the same between the old and new procedure. So there were a few analysis constraints associated with this survey, namely dissimilar observation units and survey dates that were different across the data set, meaning that it was difficult to pair the, the data sets together. There are also time-related factors, meaning that um, it makes it difficult to parse out what specifically is influencing populations of birds that we're seeing at Cligo. For example, we know that spring migration is advancing, um, that climate change is advancing the timing of spring migration, but we're not necessarily able to um, see how that is specifically influencing populations at Cligo. We also know um, that we have a small sample size. So at the species level, my sample size was three, and at the individual level, my sample size was 55. I ran a test for power, which essentially means that 
A power of a test is the ability of a test to discriminate between statistically significant differences in means. My power were 0.07. We usually go for a power of 0.80, meaning that the data set has to grow considerably to about 2,000 to achieve the power that we want to see. So my next steps for Cligo are that we continue to collect data, that we standardize the survey units so that that data set can grow and be matched, and that we continue to test for power as that data set grows to make sure that our conclusions are statistically significant. So what does all this statistical analysis mean at the end of the day for the park? It means that the data from the old and new procedure can be analyzed as one large data set so we can get longitudinal data and analysis going all the way back to 2003. And we can also begin to start monitoring marble murrelet populations a little bit more closely to determine if they are actually increasing in the way that we've seen in 2023. Um, Cligo has the perfect nesting environment for marble murrelets. They prefer old growth forests off of the coast. They lay one egg every year. Um, they don't build nests. They, they lay one egg on these um, mossy branches that can be found in old growth forests. Um, so Cligo and Southeast Alaska generally is uh, the perfect environment for the conservation of this bird species. These are my references. And I'd like to acknowledge my supervisor, Elaine Furbish, Jen Larson, Gail, our Plinkett Cultural Ambassador, as well as our wonderful volunteers, Mike Consler and Braden Jones, and Environment for the Americas for this opportunity. Thank you. Hi, great presentation. Um, why do you think that it's in uh, just in this part of Alaska that the population is growing? Because, uh, sorry, I'm from, I'm, I'm sure you know, but Olympic National Park also offers pretty similar habitats. So I was just curious why. Right. Um, it's largely due to deforestation and land use changes along the coast. Um, like I mentioned, marble murrelets really like old growth forests. So that there has to be intact forest cover in order for them to um, nest on those high branches, those high mossy branches. And unfortunately, along the coast and many other parts of the Pacific Northwest, there's been a very long history and legacy of um, logging. And that just has not been occurring at the same degree in Southeast Alaska and at Cligo generally. So that's why we're seeing those population increases hypothetically. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Good job. Great work. Thank, great job. Congratulations to our interns from this last session.